Welcome, uh, brothers and sisters, for this uh, late night presentation and a happy Sabbath to the people who are in Africa. I'm so glad to bring to you this two part presentation on uh, the issue of uh, the nature of Christ, but um, also uh, I want to look at uh, what we call what uh, I taught in Indiana by R.S. Donnell, uh, something that was so connected closely to the Holy Flesh movement. And um, the reason I bring this two-part presentation is that uh, we may be able to understand the issues at stake. And uh, this is the case that surrounds scale of teachings and uh, what he later came to introduce to uh, the denomination. And by having some background of uh, what was Kellogg's teachings and how it was related to uh, uh, the mysticism of India and all that stuff, we'll be able to comprehend what the Lord will want us to understand this time so that uh, we may be able to avoid the pitfalls that comes with uh, uh, believing the things that. Uh, the Lord has not told us to believe. And so I'll offer a word of prayer and then now uh, we can enter fully into this presentation. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for, you have seen it good that we may be able to study together. We pray that uh, the spirit of understanding, your wisdom may be upon us as we go through this uh, two part series. And so let your name be glorified as we look uh, into the truth that you want us to learn. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, I pray that uh, this will not just be information, but uh, we will learn something that will help us to move uh, closer to Christ. Now, R.S. Donnell was one of uh, the leaders of the Holy Flesh Movement and uh, the president of the Indiana Conference during uh, the period of his involvement with the movement. And uh, after it is demise, that is the Holy Flesh Movement, uh, he resigned his position, but later called um, uh, to serve the church in Raleigh, Tennessee, that is near Memphis. However, after a couple of years, in 1907, he was disfellowshipped from uh, uh, he was disfellowshipped for preaching the holy flesh. His claim was that he did not, but taught the same as he had in Indiana. And so, uh, we want to look at the things that uh, he taught in Indiana and uh, why did the denomination really disfellowship him, and how is that all connected to? the very things that were in the living temple and what was espoused then uh, uh, as how do Christians come to possess uh, the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Um, and um, I thought that I could do this in the series of the final uh, generation, but uh, I just want to do this uh, um, apart from that series, so that when we come to that series of righteousness by faith, we may see how the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit imparts our life and uh, we can be able to walk in truth. Um, speaking of the Holy Flesh message, uh, R.S. Donnell stated that uh, now is the time for a Laodicea, for the Laodicean or cleansing message. The Laodicean message involves the nature of Christ's hand. Uh, uh, he, his call was uh, a time to have these people who will actually replicate uh, the divine nature of Jesus Christ, a church which was holy and um, ready to be translated. And so it becomes embarrassingly obvious that the nature of Christ's view uh, he promulgated at the height of the Holy Flesh movement and hence it is chief doctrinal cornerstone is virtually identical to the view put forward in our church books, current church books 
about um, having the nature of Christ or other people uh, looking into this thing that um, how uh, can a Christian be a Christian and uh, stand holy in the uh, in the presence of God. Uh, then uh, uh, R.S. Donnell uh, spent the rest of his uh, articles uh, when he was giving his series on the teachings of the Holy Flesh movement, uh, uh, expounding more much on uh, how the indwelling of God happens in a believer. Uh, and uh, this, this really, in his teachings, affected the nature of Christ. So a little investigation uh, shows that the author of the review and herald articles on, uh, uh, on, um, on the Holy Flesh movement uh, and uh, R.S. Donnell's opening in the nature of Christ was uh, A.T. Jones of uh, the 1888 poem fame. And so the Lord has no doubt allowed to be put on record for all to see the two opposing views to help people in their deciding. Uh, he, he writes, this is what he writes that, uh, of the holy flesh doctrine, when I'm gone from here, none are to pick up any points of this doctrine and call it truth. There is not a thread of truth in the holy fabric, in the whole fabric. That is um, G. A. Robert quoting E. G. White's The Holy Flesh Fanatism in uh, Ellen G. White's statement document file 119. And uh, of the 1888 message, uh, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elder Su Wagoner and Jones. You can read that in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel, page uh, 91. And um, the doctrine of righteousness by faith was to uplift Jesus Christ. And um, if I can just go to uh, TM91, let us look at this as uh, we look into this holy flesh doctrine and what R.S. Donald really taught. In uh, TM, page 91, this is uh, what um, we read. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elder Wagner and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the afflicted say that the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person his merits and his changeless love for human family. All power is given into his hands and he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. And so how did the teachers of righteousness by faith move from teaching what the Lord had given to espousing Indian mysticism that uh, the church had even to reach to a point of disfellowshipping them. Uh, it, it had to earlier been noted that E.G. White had uh, also written that the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep of hidden truth. That is found in uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 244. So the humanity of Christ is everything to us, but which one? Which one will you choose? The Christ of the 1888 message or the Christ of the Holy Flesh movement? Uh, and uh, such a questions can be found in um, questions on doctrine, movement of destiny, and Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. Those are some of the questions that are really um, uh, asked. Uh, and uh, the time that you're living in is a very serious time. And the time has come when we cannot depend upon the doctrine which comes to our ears unless we see that it is harmonizes with the word of God because we are in a state where we should be keen in what we hear and be keen in what we speak. There are dangerous heresies that will be presented as Bible doctrines 
and we are to become acquainted with the Bible so that uh, we may know how to meet them. The faith of every individual will be tested. And we want that uh, when we are tested, we be found not having confused uh, voices of uh, this and that, but um, having the word of God indwelling in us. And uh, we are told that sanctify the Lord in the heart that we may give a reason of the hope and the faith we have. And so, uh, Donald, R.S. Donald says that uh, in a, a letter issue of Watchman, I am charged with uh, teaching whole flesh and that uh, I imbibed and taught the same thing while I was in Indiana. Now, let, let, let me just project something uh, of what uh, this brother says. I, I like really us to get it so that uh, we may know what was this that uh, he was teaching. Um, now, it happens that I have a series of articles in position which I wrote while I was laboring in Indiana. Uh, just back up for a minute. Yes, he says that uh, now it is so happens that I have a series of articles in my possession which I wrote while I was laboring in Indiana and which were published in the Indiana Reporter. These articles all bear upon what I taught in Indiana to which opposition was taken by a number of general conference committee. This opposition was so strongly urged that I finally resigned my position as president of the conference. The articles were headed, did Christ come to the world in a sinful flesh? Why I was charged with teaching holy flesh, I know not, unless it was that in my article, as well as in the pulpit, I took negative side of um, the question. He continues to say, um, I have decided to republish these articles in a leaflet or truck form and uh, herewith submit them to the candid consideration of the people and let them decide for themselves what is taught in them or how much I have said about holy flesh in humanity. The Laodicean message involves the nature of Christ and the articles. And um, he continues to say in this article, uh, this is uh, what he continues to say. In connection with the these articles, I also, published some question asked me in writing by my successor in office in the Indiana conference together with my answers to the same. Please read this leaflet carefully and then decide as to how much justice there was in the movement on the 24th day of February 1907, that is to disfellowship R.S. Donald, to deprive me of my credentials as a minister of the gospel of Christ and turn me out of the church because I taught the same things in Memphis, Tennessee that I taught in Indiana. And so what, what are these things that um, he taught that um, really agitated the church to disfellowship him? And these are the things we are going to look at and see if these things are being taught as we happen today. And if you are in the church, then will you be disfellowshipped or will you stand as uh, a good member of the church? Um, in asking, did Christ come to this world in a sinful flesh? In his response in Article 1, he says, to those who are preparing for translation, the question with which we introduce this article becomes indeed an important one. In speaking of their condition and what they are to be when the Lord returns to the earth to gather up his people, 1 John 3 to says, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And further than this, it is evident that those who are prepared to meet him when he comes know what he is. And prior to that event, set to work to become like him for the next verses. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That is 1 John 3 2. Then, in order to be ready to meet the Savior and to be like him at his coming, all should understand the condemnation of Christ. And whether or not in that condemnation he took upon himself sinful flesh and retained it during his life working on earth, 
And uh, Father, they should know the work that Christ came into this world to do and just what was required of him in life and character in order that he might be able to accomplish that work. Uh, R.S. Donnell says that the Bible says that he came into the world to save sinners. And the spirit of prophecy says the life of Jesus was one of laborious, self-denying effort to bring man back to his first estate. He came to expel the demons that he had that had controlled the will. Yeah, excuse me. He came to expel the demons that uh, had controlled the will. He came to lift up from the dust to reshape the mad character after the pattern of his divine character and to make it beautiful with his own glory. And he goes ahead to quote Desire of Ages, page 42, which talks about the restoration of the image of Christ in man. So just here, uh, I might ask this question, in order to convert the people of some heathen land to Christianity, how will the church go about it? Will they select some man possessed of the sinful traits and propensities of the people to whom they send him, hoping thus to elevate them to the standard of true Christianity, or will they send one who had himself embraced all the doctrines of Christianity and had by them been purified and noble and like unto what they hope to do for the people unto whom he sent? And so in sending somebody to the places where people have been converted, do you send a sinner or do you send a person who is pure? That is what in essence R.S. Donnell uh, is asking. The answer to that is easy, he says. All who say, don't send a man whose life would be unlike the faith intended to be taught, but send one in whom the power of the faith of Christianity is revealed, that in that man and in his life may be shown to them what the faith that he offers will do for them when they apply it unto their own lives. That is right. And so in redeeming a world, God must send one into the world with all the characteristics in him, not of the people in their fallen condition to whom he has gone, but of the people lifted from their fallen condition and restored to their first estate. And so what Donnell is trying, R.S. Donnell trying to say is that when Christ comes, he is in the condition pre-fall and not the condition after the fall. Because his argument is that um, if you have to send somebody on the mission, you have to send somebody who is um, not in the same condition with the people you are sending to to be converted. And so he carries that argument into the nature of Christ that in order Christ to be sent on earth, he has to be sent in a pre-fall condition rather than in a fallen condition. Otherwise, it won't help those he's going to win back to the image of God. And so he continues to say, um, and we believe this is to be just what God did. Say ye not of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemeth, because I said I am the son of God, John 10, 36. Here we are told that Christ was sanctified and sent to the world. That is, when he came into the world, he stood as a representative, a perfect sample of what he proposed to do for all whom he would accept of and believe in him. And so we have already read the work of Christ was to restore man to his estate. That estate is not possessed in our sinful condition. For it was through sin that man lost it. It may be necessary to notice for a moment in what that first estate consi consisted, that we may have before us that to which we are to be restored through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Referring back to man in his first estate at the time of the creation, the psalmist say, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with the glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Here then was man's first estate, and um, when Adam stood in it, we are told that he stood there in the image of him over whose works we had dominion, even the image of God in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and on uh, uh, page 88 of the spirit of prophecy. And so for Christ to be sent, Donnell says that uh, he has to be sent in a pre-fall estate. If he's sent in a, a fallen estate, his fallen state, then uh, th th there is nothing he can offer to humanity. But uh, uh, actually, is this according to what the Hebrews 
say or is it according to what he sees that and what he's thinking because uh, the book of hebrews is so clear that um he was made unto like his brethren um in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, 8, referring to the change road as the result of the fall, the apostle says, but we see not yet all things put under him. No man fell and lost this estate, man, the image of God in him. He now needs a restorer, a savior. So the apostle continued, verse 9, says, but we see Jesus. In what way do we see him? Ah, we see him coming as the restorer, as the savior of the fallen race. So Aris Donald says, and how, now how must he come? Must he come possessed of the inherent traits of the fallen race, or while he comes as a man, should he not come as a man redeemed, possessed of all the traits of character, all the inherent principles of godly nature? So the argument of uh, R.S. Donnell is again that um, Christ must come in a redeemed condition to be able to redeem those who is coming to redeem. Now, remember, the church disfellowshipped R.S. Donnell for teaching such a things that Christ came in uh, not in a sinful nature. Christ came already redeemed so as to redeem those who are fallen. And so he says that Christ cannot come possessed of the inherent traits of a fallen race. He must come possessing another nature for to be able to save those who are not um, in sin. And so, if Christ could come in a fallen nature, in a sinful nature, then it means there is nothing he can offer to a man. And surely, he says, R.S. Donald says, and surely he must be possessed of those attributes which offers to those whom he comes to restore. It will be worse than foolishness for me to offer you a thousand dollars when I do not possess a penny. So with the savior of the world, he must possess that which he offers us. These attributes and titles must be in him. Man must see in the restorer himself the results of the work that he proposes to accomplish for man. In short, if Christ possesses, proposes to restore man to his first estate, he must come to man standing in that estate himself. He must come standing where Adam, the first owner, stood before he fell. Those are the sentiments of Aris Donnell. That is where the world must see him. And thank God it is just at this point that the Bible represents him. So, and where does he go to quote that? In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, exactly the record concerning Adam for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. And so uh, he says that uh, he argues, why will the church come to a position of disfellowshipping me if I say that uh, Christ came in? Uh, the nature of Adam preferred. Now, I'll be looking at some of the things as uh, I continue or when I'm coming to an end of part one of this presentation. What is so wrong with uh, what Aris Donnell is saying that uh, Christ must come in his glorified nature, Christ must come in a redeemed nature, and Christ must come uh, pre-fall uh, Adam. He argues, um, in the last paragraph of his article one, he says that this must be so. What must be so? Christ to come in a, a state pre-fall of Adam. For Paul continues the subject in verse 11 of Hebrews 2. For both he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified, not those he is going to sanctify are a donor said, but they are already sanctified are all of one, which for which cause he's not ashamed to call them his brethren. Notice that it is sanctified ones who he is not ashamed to call brethren. Father, it is the sanctified ones of who, whose flesh he partakes. For so much then as the children of, or brethren sanctified ones are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, just as the sanctified ones are partakers um, or took of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so in he, he he quotes Hebrews 2 11 and say that Christ must come um, in a state of those who are already sanctified. In uh, Article 2 of uh, his argument, why did the church disfellowship me and what did I teach in Indiana? He says, 
In uh, taking up this subject, we will begin just where we left off in the last article, in that when we closed, we were considering the fact that Christ himself took part of the flesh and blood just as the children did. That is, he took part of the same flesh that the children possessed. We found also that the children are the sanctified ones. Now, the sanctified ones are surely those upon whom the truth of God and the power of the Holy Spirit has wrought. The ones who are new creatures in Christ Jesus who have been created unto good work, the same which God had before ordained that um, they should walk in. And so men can continually do righteous acts only as God incarnating them. And it was God's purpose from the beginning to dwell in every created being so that good works or he himself might always appear in them. But in sinful men, Satan is incarnate and God and Satan cannot dwell together. The only reason why God does not dwell in man is because sin is there. And in order for God to again dwell in man, sin must be eradicated. The body of Christ was a body in which God was incarnate. And as God and Satan cannot dwell together, the body of Christ must have been a body from which even every tendency to sin must have been wholly eradicated. Now, he talks about... Uh, tended this to sin and uh, 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 sin propensities that uh, uh, these things had been eradicated in Christ before he came, for he cannot come to offer that which he doesn't have. And uh, maybe we have to look into that in another way. Did Christ have any pool of sin? Did Christ... Uh, was Christ, the, the question narrows down to this. Uh, was Christ in his, his human nature able to sin or not able to sin? If he were not kept by the power of God, would he succumb to sin? The, the obvious answer is yes. And although the experience in Gethsemane is not seen, where he tells his father, if it is possible to take away the cup, but not according to my will, but according to your will. It shows that humanity of Christ or what he can desire to be done. And that alone tells you that uh, humanity without the power of God in it can succumb to sin. To say that um, Christ came in a state that the saints will be found in, that is a state where they cannot sin, uh, when he comes to take them uh, to the Father, is uh, really to try to negate the points that Christ could see when he was on this earth. And so in proof, he says, in proof of the above statement that Christ was in a state of the redeemed already, he says that I'll quote Desire of Ages. Now, I don't know how the church was able to disfellowship him when he was quoting Desire of Ages, page 117. And remember, I don't agree with the, what R.S. Donnell taught Donald taught because it is uh, it was the church said that it was holy flesh and those who have studied holy flesh they know what actually it means that um, anything that you do if Christ is in in dwelling is not sin at all because it is Christ in you doing the things that you are doing so anything you do cannot cannot be seen you, you can be as arrogant as you can. You can do whatever thing you do, but because you have a holy flesh, then it cannot be counted as sin because you have gone through the same and experience and you have now been redeemed. You are sanctified and everything in you is holy. Um, I, I wish that we could go into that. And so he says that um, the body of Christ was a body in which God was incarnate and he quotes Zerf Ages 117, which says, from eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy set up to man should be a temple of the indwelling of the creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple of God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But uh, by the incarnation of the son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled once again, once again. And so... Uh, he says, this certainly proves that Christ dwelt in the same kind of flesh as do the brethren, the restored ones. And he says how clear it is from this statement that the cause of for God's forsaking humanity as his temple must be removed before he can return and again occupy as it was his purpose from eternity. This removal was wrought when Christ became 
incarnate in human flesh, even in yours and mine, that when uh, actually we have the spirit of Christ indwelling in us, we become of different nature. But what kind of nature? We shall continue seeing what he says about this. And so, and of this Christ was perfect example and exhibition of what the power of God or Christ uh, dwelling in us will do for us. How evident then that when Christ came into this world to save it, uh, he must come possessed of that perfect restoration, at least so far as sinless life is concerned, which he offers to man. He must manifest in himself the good that he will do to humanity should they accept his work. And speaking of Christ, in the little track entitled Christ Tempted As We Are, it says he came to pass through the experience of humanity to pass over the same ground on which Adam had fallen. So uh, to redeem his uh, to redeem his failure, to meet and conquer the adversary of God and man, that uh, through his grace man might be an overcomer and finally have a place with him on his throne. This plainly states that Christ came to pass over the same ground on which Adam had fallen. But notice for a moment, where did Adam stand before the fall? Now he goes again the same argument that Adam passed the ground before his fall in a nature which did not, was not fallen. And so Christ to come, he came not in a fallen nature. We found in our last article that when Adam was assailed by the tempter, he was without the tent of sin. Then he was holy. Now, in order to pass over the same ground that Adam passed over, Christ would most assuredly have to begin just where Adam began. That is uh, Adam preferred. He will certainly have to stand just where Adam stood, and that will be without the taint of sin. And so we read in Luke 135, Donald said, Therefore also that holy thing that shall be born of him, of thee shall be called the Son of God. From an article from the pen of Miss White in the Science of the Time, uh, January 16, 1896, we read, the humanity of Christ is called the holy thing. Now, we know that his divinity was holy, and if his humanity was holy, then we do know that the thing which was born of the Virgin Mary was in every essence and sense a holy thing and did not possess the tendency to sin. But you ask, did not Christ take unto himself the liability to sin? Most certainly he did, and he could have sinned, but we must understand that there is the difference between the tendency and liability. Now, Christ took upon himself the liability to sin, but not the tendency. He took the liability to sin when he passed over the same ground that Adam passed. When Adam came from the placid hand of his creator, he had in himself no tendency to sin. But when he came to a certain point in his experience, he underwent the liability to sin, and there he did fail. Fall um, and fell, and through that fall received sin in his flesh, and thus the tendon. Now, in order for Christ to get sin in his flesh, in passing over the same ground that Adam passed over, when he came to the same point of Christ's experience where the liability to sin was laid upon him, he too must fall in order to partake of the uh, nature of Adam. Now, you see a mix-up of things that um, Adam passed through a certain experience, and it was only when he sinned that he, be, he, he, he possessed the tendency to sin. But uh, he had the liability when he was passing through that experience, but it's only when he sinned that he came to have the tendency to sin. And then he says, Christ also came in the nature of Adam pre-fall, and he could only come to the state of tendency to sin if he has fallen into sin, meaning that he remained in the state of Adam pre-fall. Now, th 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 there's a lot of issues in this because um, uh, we are told that he partook of uh, the nature of Adam, not pre-fall, but after fall. And so uh, in, uh, let us go to Romans chapter eight, verses three. Romans chapter eight, verses three.
Is it verse 3 or verse 6? Verse 3. In uh, Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 3, we read, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, you cannot say Adam pre-fall had a sinful flesh. That is not true at all. And so what uh, Donnell is trying to say that uh, Christ only took the liability to sin, but he did not take the sinful flesh. But let, let, let us continue to listen to what he has to say on these issues. Christ did not fall. He redeemed Adam's failure. He conquered the enemy and escaped, receiving no sin in the flesh. And as in the same art, when the signs of the time already referred to, he, he, cor he corrupted not his human nature. And uh, though in the flesh he transgressed no law of God in any particular, in volume three of spirit, volume two of the spirit of prophecy, there is the old edition, page 60. We are told that he had sinless humanity. And in volume two bound testimonies, page 201, 202, we read he is a brother in our um, infirmity, but not possessing life passions. And again, in the same sign, in referring us to how he stood as Adam stood, it says Jesus humbled himself, clothed with his divinity, with humanity, in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family. Now, these arguments of um, Aris Donnell are the same arguments that uh, Kellogg says that uh, I'm really saying exactly what E.G. White is saying. And then E.G. White says, no, I'm not saying what you are saying. And so other than the words looking the same, there is a thought that, that doesn't match. And so you could place the words of R.S. Donnell, Kellogg, and E.G. White side by side, and you see that they are speaking almost the same thing. But then when you come to the thoughts of those um, wordings, you find that there are difference. And uh, E.G. White was able to say that these things cannot be patched, but uh, the whole book needs to be destroyed. The same mysticism that was in his teaching is what was carried into Kellogg's teaching. And E.G. White said that far be if that uh, uh, I'm teaching what Kellogg is teaching. We, we shall see how this links up. Now, he says that the fact that Christ was tempted upon all points as we are tempted and yet without sin should be sufficient evidence in self to prove that there was not even the tendency to sin in him. We hope that no one will become mixed on this point or misconstrue our meaning, for we have already stated that in coming to this world and passing over the same ground that Adam passed over, he underwent the liability to sin, for when he reached the point where, where Adam, uh, point where Adam fell, there he laid himself liable to do the same thing that Adam did. But thank God he passed safely over it and maintained his allegiance. So when, when uh, Eve brought the fruit to Adam, at that point, Adam reached the liability to sin without possessing the sinful nature. And then he sinned and possess the sinful nature. But then we find, th this is the argument of Donnie, but we find that Christ came to that point and when Satan came and told him, turn this bread in, turn these stones into bread, at that point, he came into possession with the liability to sin. But because he did not sin, he did not possess the sinful nature you can see a mix up of things. It will hardly seem necessary to give any further proof to sustain the point stated above that, but I cannot forbear uh, quoting the testimonies. And he goes ahead to quote the testimonies, page 32, uh, testimony 32, page 178, which says, he was tempted in all points like we are tempted. Satan stood ready to, ass ready to assail him at every step, hurling at him his fierce temptations. Yet he did not sin. When Christ came to this earth, he came to make himself an offering of sin. And in order to make an offering that would be acceptable to the Father, 
he must at least be as free from sin in every particular as was Adam before he fell. Going to all the nature that Adam possessed, that is what exactly uh, Jesus possessed. So R.S. Donald argues. And, and then you, you sit back and ask yourself, so how is this a problem? Why did the church disfellowship uh, R.S. Donald and how is it different from what we teach? But uh, I have to say that uh, his argument on the nature of Christ that uh, when he was tempted by Satan, at that point he became liable to sin, but when he overcame it, he escaped partaking of the nature uh, of the sinful nature. That, that is a mix up of things because it will be a contradictory with the, the Bible. And uh, uh, looking into this article two, he says there were plenty of bodies here on earth, but they were all in the same condition. They had all sinned and came short of the glory of God. But in order to save man, Christ must enter humanity. And because all were sinners and not a body could be found that was suitable, what had to be done? A body had to be made for the occasion. And so we read in Hebrews 10, 5, a body has thou prepared for me. In making his body that which and fitted all other bodies uh, uh, that is uh, enmity against God, the carnal mind was left out, having abolished in flesh the enmity of Ephesians 2.15. So he came in a sanctified manner. He came in a redeemed manner. He came a person who had, uh, 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 who had been, been sanctified by God. But uh, again, if Donald, Donald taught that uh, Christ came in a redeemed state. I want you to think about the redeemed state, uh, that um, Christ came in a redeemed state, in a sanctified state. He says that a body prepared in making his body that which has unfitted all other bodies, a body which was against, uh, uh, which was enmity against God, and the carnal mind was left out, having abolished all in his flesh, the enmity. So Christ came already a conqueror, already a redeemed person, a sanctified person. Now, if that is the state that Christ came in, the, 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 the dangerous thing about this is that um, to say that Christ already came in a redeemed state, in a sanctified state, a state which had already conquered everything, when did Christ experience humanity? so as to be able to be uh, seen in a state of the redeemed. I hope that point comes clear, that if he came in a state where the redeemed will be found in, then he, he we have just to conclude logically that uh, before Christ was incarnated, he had conquered all the experiences of humanity. Now, Whatever thing that he went through when he was a human being, there is nothing to him because he came in a state where he had conquered that. Now, how, how is that possible? It is impossible because if that is the case, then there is no need of Christ coming to the earth to pass through what Adam passes through or humanity passes through, then goes back and sends his efficacious spirit. Why would Christ come to pretend that he's going through what humanity has gone through when already he has come in a redeemed state. Now you start seeing the implications of the statements that Aris Donald is using, that Christ came in a redeemed state, in a sanctified state, in a state where the saints will be found in when Christ comes the second time in the clouds of the air. What is the meaning of that actually? If Christ had conquered humanity before he came to the world, then even the temptation of turning the stones into bread is no temptation to him because he had conquered that before he came to the world. Everything that he went through, the contradictions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those people who wanted to trap him when he was here as a human, there were nothing to him because he came in a redeemed state, in a state where he had already conquered humanity. When you start looking closely at what R.S. Donald is saying, then it means that... Um, 
the humanity of Christ is not something unto us. And uh, it is not uh, something that, uh, it is not, uh, Uh, sorry for that. Uh, it, it's not something that uh, we should uh, see that Christ went through. We can pretend that we have also gone through that. That holy thing that uh, shall be born of this shall be called the Son of God. And so he gives this argument in Luke chapter 1, verse 33. And we have already proved that humanity of Christ was the holy thing. So now, we have a body that which is accepted an offering. And which body is this? The body that has already conquered sin is what Christ partook of. Now, what kind, what kind of uh, message is he trying to preach at that point? Uh, what kind of message will he be trying to teach uh, at that point? Uh, continued on, he says, uh, he continues to say, talking about the body of Christ that was made for him, a body that had um, already been dreamed. This is certainly in harmony in the statement found in Hebrews 2, which places Christ when he came to this earth, just where Adam stood before the fall. This will endow him with all the qualifications for righteousness that Adam possessed before the fall, and that man must possess when back to the into the grace of God. So Christ, he says, Donald says that Christ comes possessing the nature that man will be possessing just prior to the second coming of Christ. I, I hope you see the, the problem. Uh, with that, and uh, as we try to come to an end, uh, in his article two of the presentations he did in Indiana, he says, after the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God, and he sought to carry the universe with him in his belief. Um, Satan's words appeared to be true, and Christ came to um, unmask the deceiver. The majesty of heaven undertook the course of man, and with the same faculties that man may obtain without the temptation of Satan as man must withstand them. So he argues that um, when Christ came, uh, he took the faculties that man may obtain without the temptations of Satan as man must withstand them. Now, think, think of this. It can give you a headache when you are reading what uh, Donald actually had uh, was saying. I'll repeat the statement. After the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God, and he sought to carry the universe with him in this belief. Satan's words appeared to be true, and Christ came to unmask the deceiver. And how did Christ come? Listen to this statement. The majesty of heaven undertook the course of man. And with the same faculties that man may obtain without the temptations of Satan, as man must withstand them. So Christ had the faculties of man that um, that ha ha had not been tempted with Satan, uh, or uh, that which he will obtain after overcoming sin. The faculties that man will have after overcoming sin, or the faculties that man has without the temptations of Satan, that is the faculties that Christ came and stood with when he was on this earth. Now, really, did Christ possess the faculties of man before the temptation? 
what will be the essence of the Bible saying that he came possessing the mind of a human and he was born of the seed of David if actually Christ came standing in the nature of man without the temptations and the nature of man after overcoming the devil. It doesn't make sense at all to say that Christ was born of the seed of David, as it is in Romans chapter 1. And then again revert to saying that he came in a state that man stands without temptation. What kind of faculties or what kind of nature does man have without the temptations of Satan? Obviously, a state which is not fallen per se or a state which has overcome sin. And so Christ came to the earth taking humanity and standing as man's representative to show in the controversy with Satan that man as God created him, connected with the Father and the Son could obey the divine requirement, which is uh, uh, it's a mixture of this and a mixture of that. But how could man obey every divine requirement as God created him? Now, if Christ came to show this, he must come to this world standing just where man stood, at his creation and not after the fall. Remember these things made Donald to be uh, this fellowship. And uh, I, I want you to start asking yourself that uh, if, if, you, if you taught such a thing, so will you be still a member of the church in a good standing. Now, the last two uh, 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 maybe slides and uh, we close. We shall go to part two tomorrow. The purity and holiness of Christ, the spotless righteousness of him who did no sin was a perpetual reproach upon sin um, in the world of sensuality and sin. In his life, the light of truth was flashed amid the moral darkness with which Satan had enshrouded the world. Christ exposed Satan's falsehood and deceived. Uh, Christ exposed Satan's falsehood and deceiving character, and in many hearts, destroying the corrupting influence, which is not uh, a bad thing. And so he goes ahead and say, "Now in Christ, he saw God revealed in His true character." But I ask, could this have been so if Christ came to this earth in a sinful flesh? or possessed of sinful tenderness. I ask, does God possess this? We have just read that Christ was a perfect representative of God. And so Christ came, um, uh, Christ came as a representative of God. And uh, we read that I and my father are one. Christ says, I and my father are one. So he could not come to this earth in a sinful flesh or in such a, a way. And so he asked, uh, I ask, does God possess sinful nature? Does God possess propensities of uh, sinful tenderness? Now, this, this, he, he poses some statements and asks some statements which actually cannot, doesn't really attend to what he's asking. Now, he's saying Christ and the Father are one. And if so, Christ and the Father are one, can we say Christ came in a sinful flesh? Is God possessing such? You see how Donald really asked his question, which means Christ just came as God would come from heaven. And the only thing is a body of flesh, but nothing less than that. But then we, we have to understand Christ came on this earth that uh, 4,000 of years had generated the rest. And then uh, uh, he followed after the law of heredity. Christ did not come in a state that Adam was pre -fall. For Adam, the strength he had is not the strength that Christ had when he came on this earth. The, 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 the state of Adam, the nature of Adam had not been deteriorated by 4,000 years of sin. 
When Christ comes on this earth, he takes the law of heredity, a world that had generated 4,000 years of sin. And so you could not compare the nature of Adam with the nature of Christ when he's coming on the earth, because this is a whole total different thing, a nature which had been affected by sin. And then uh, I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, he says in Article 4, the majesty of heaven undertook the course of man and with the same facilities that man may obtain withstood the temptation of Satan as must, man must withstand them. In the fall or in redemption, a different set of faculties is not given to man. In both cases, he possesses the same faculties. In the fall, man's faculties were only perverted and in redemption, they were restored. This perversion of the faculties is what causes in man the tendency to sin. Now, will any man take the position that Christ came into this world with the faculties even of this human nature perverted? I think not. We have already found a proof that he did not. The humanity of Christ was a holy thing. And that is in the book of Luke. And so he already said that we have ascertained that Christ could not come in the nature that man has today or had then in 4 BC because Christ said, I and my father are one. And so if Christ says that A, I and my father are one, then it means that what the state that God is in is the same state that Christ is in. But if the state that God is in is the same as the state that Christ was in, then we have a big, big problem as humanity because Christ cannot be our example in this earth because he doesn't possess the same state that we possess. It will be good to guard over these things because some of them seem so good and uh, exempting Jesus Christ from our nature so that uh, we may not enter into this era. How can he, in his nature, redeem us if he is in the same nature that we are in? Those are some of the arguments that uh, people may have. These facilities or what may obtain these facilities are what we may obtain as a free gift from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter expresses in thus, according as his divine power hath given unto all of us. And so uh, those, are, those are these four series articles of uh, Donald talking about the nature of Christ. How did he come? And lastly, he says, let us now come directly to the examination of the question asked as heading to the articles. Did Christ come to this world in a sinful flesh? He asks. I have been searching and asking for the Bible text that says he did. And the nearest to it is the one in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. So he says, when we talk about Christ coming in a sinful flesh, he has been searching a scripture. But the one that comes so close to that is Romans chapter 8, 3. Let us read it for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, in the place of this text telling us that he did come in a sinful flesh, it only says that he came in the likeness of it. Philippians 2.8 says, and being found in a fashion as a man. A man may have two coats, but in the way they are cut, one different from the other, so that while they are both recognized as coats, their fashion is unlike. One may be short, the other long, or there may be some particularly in the cut of one that does not appear in the other. Now, the Bible presents before us two men, two Adams. It tells us that the first Adam was made a, a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. But also this issue of uh, quickening spirit, we must understand when was Christ made a quickening spirit? The first man is of the earth. The earth, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Now let us look at the first man while a while and beside him stand one who has been deteriorated and degenerated by the effects of the infirmities of sin. The first one, Adam, was as tall again as men are today, a majestic frame and a gigantic mind called, in fact, the son of God in Luke 3.18. That is what Adam was called. 
but the likeness of fashion of his race has been changed. Men, by the time that Christ came to this world through the infirmity and the generous of sin had become so reduced that they had almost lost the divine image. This comparison is well expressed in uh, Great Controversy, page uh, 644 and 645, where the race is presented as coming forth from the grave. All came from their graves the same in stature as when they entered the tomb. Adam, who stands among the risen throng, is of a lofty height and majesty form in stature, but little below the Son of God. He presents a marked contrast to the people of last later generation. In this one respect, shown the great generous of the race, but all arise with the freshness and vigor uh, of eternal youth. But Christ came to restore that which had been lost. He will change our vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. The mortal corrupt form, devoid of calmness, once polluted with sin, uh, becomes perfect, beautiful, and immortal. The last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed, and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of the Lord, our God, in mind and soul and body, reflecting the perfect image of the Lord. When Christ came to this earth, he did not take the likeness or fashion of Adam as he stood in his perfect manhood, but that of his race in later generations. Yes, he took it when he, the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted uh, the result of the working of the great law of heredity. Yes, he came subject to the weakness of humanity. He had to meet his perils in common with every human soul. He took human nature upon him, but that, that implied that he took sinful nature with him. If so, then he takes sinful nature into heaven and carries forever. So that is the argument that if he came and took the sinful nature, then he carries to heaven. So um, Donald Jones ends by saying, we are to take Christ as our pattern. We are to be like him. And it is by beholding that we become changed. Now, if we behold a savior with sin, and it is from pain that is in him, we are to not to be made better than he is. And so we will always retain the propensities that we see in him. We can get out of Christ only just what we see in him. And that is a different nature from what we have. What a way of putting things. We can get out of Christ only just what we see in him. And that is a different nature from us. Let us not lower the standard any longer, but let us elevate it by holding up the Savior before the church and the world so that we may see him as he is and by his saving power to be cleansed from every evil propensity. And so there are the four articles of what uh, Donald taught. When we shall be examining them so closely, how they impact the gospel and how it really affects those who read it, we shall see that actually it, uh, it is a weaving of truth and error. That if Christ really was not of our nature, we have no hope at all. We don't have our example. There, there are those who teach that Christ had an uh, advantage, but then we are told that the same advantages that Christ had, we also have in that he depended on his father to be able to overcome sin. And we can have the same. In, in the book of John 3, 34, we are told that he whom God has sent, he giveth the spirit without measure. And uh, people have stumbled upon this statement. Uh, I'll just bring it to uh, John 3, 34, as we bring to this to a close, 3, 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit of measure unto him. And some people take this statement to mean that Christ had an advantage. He had a power that uh, we not have. But then I want you to look at uh, another statement that responds to that. Uh, and this should be in Ephesians.
um, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, we read this. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now think of this, John 3, 34 says that for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. And then we are told that also we can have the fullness of God. It is only by depending on God that we possess that fullness. It is not that Christ had an advantage, for if Christ had an advantage, then how can we be able to know that we can overcome sin? Now unto him that is able to exceeding, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you, we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, that is the fullness of God. If we subject our will to the will of God, then we can possess the fullness of God. The power of God can work in us to be able to accomplish what Christ accomplished when he was on the earth. And so we cannot say that um, Christ had an advantage over humanity. We can only give that excuse to excuse our sin, but we cannot give it as an excuse for anything. And so as we shall be coming to part two of what Aris Donnell taught in Indiana that made him to be this fellowship, let us think about the things we have had and let us go over them and see what was this man teaching and can, can it be possible that also we are teaching the same and we shall come fully to unpacking the in uh, number two of the presentation of the Holy Flesh Movement. Otherwise, may the good Lord be with us and uh, may he continue guiding us into all truth in everything that we do that um, we may know that um, all heaven is working for us to be able to overcome every sin that may be in us. We may not have these loopholes that uh, gives us another Christ unlike us, which doesn't leave us with an example. Because in 1 John 2, 6, we are told that he who says he abides in him must walk as he walks. Now, how can you be able to walk like him if he was not like unto you? It becomes something so difficult. And uh, I pray that um, we, we may start seeing this mixture of truth and error, how it uh, leaves men doubting if they can overcome sin and they manufacture something in place that uh, suits their own uh, understanding of things. May we close with a word of prayer. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, that uh, you have given your Son, that uh, whoever has his power dwelling in him may be able to overcome sin. And Lord, we have been given Jesus Christ as our example. And so as he overcame sin, we are told we must also overcome. Be with us and help us to fix our eyes on you and fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. In his name I pray. Amen. And so God be with you and bless you until we meet in the next presentation.